Our reading this morning is taken from Anne Lamott's new book, Help, Thanks, Wow. And I have it here with me. I will tell you that I was sorely tempted to just sit and read you the first 40 pages of this book. <laughs> it's fantastic, and uh, if you like Anne Lamott, if you're familiar with her, you'll love this. If you don't know her, you should pick it up. So Anne Lamott, from her book, Help, Thanks, Wow. Where do we start on the daily walk of restoration and awakening? We start where we are. We find God in our human lives, and that includes the suffering. I get thirsty people glasses of water, even if that thirsty person is just me. My friend Tom goes through the neighborhood and picks up litter, knowing there will be just as much tomorrow. We visit those shut-ins whom a higher power seems to have entrusted to our care, various relatives, often aging and possibly annoying, or stricken friends from our church communities, people in jails or mental institutions who might be related to us, who benefit from hearing our own resurrection stories. My personal belief is that God looks through her Rolodex when she has a certain kind of desperate person in her care and assigns that person to some screwed up soul like you or me and makes it hard for us to ignore the person's suffering. So we show up even when it is extremely inconvenient or just plain awful to be there. You may need to play along with me here and act as if it would be okay with your families to break the contract and tell the truth and have and voice scary feelings. And then renounce the New York Times and your bank account as the golden calves of your life to instead imagine and act on the idea that there is a power greater than yourself. But what if you just can't, even in desperate fear? I would lend you my higher power, this sweet brown-eyed Jew who will want you to get glasses of water for everyone and then come to the beach for some nice fish. Or maybe you have a crack in your disbelief. As many great sages have said, that's how the light gets in. What if I asked you to suspend your conviction just for a few minutes and pretend there is someone outside you who hears you if you pray? If I were going to begin practicing the presence of God for the first time today, it would help to begin by admitting the three most terrible truths of our existence. That we are so ruined and so loved and in charge of so little. Of course, it wasn't our fault that we ended up so ruined or felt so undeserving of love and that if people knew our true selves better or if our minds had PA systems, they would run for their cute little lives. Can you imagine that you have a true self way down deep inside, a self that will still be there even if your mind goes? If you can imagine that, it's not such a huge step to imagine yourself believing in any sort of higher power to whom you could say, hey. Words of Anne Lamott. We'll be hearing a lot more from Ann later in the service. <clears throat> Last week, I asked us to consider how we face the tigers, the dragons, the demons in our lives. I talked about how Pai Patel, the lead character in Life of Pai, was stuck on a lifeboat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with the Bengal tiger named Richard Parker, and how sometimes we fail to recognize our own tigers when they appear, the lengths that we go sometimes to avoid confronting them, and what happens when we actually do. You may recall that I told you about the moment in the book when Pi surrenders, when in the middle of a raging storm, Pi reaches the end of his rope and finally concedes that he's not in control of his own fate. Despite weeks and weeks of work, 
where he's called upon every possible resource available to him. Pi accepts that there's nothing more that he can do to change his circumstances. He realizes deep down that he is not the captain of his own tiny ship. At that moment, he raises his arms and his eyes skyward to, hear, to the heart of the raging storm itself and declares his complete and utter submission. God's will be done. This moment is pivotal. It's a pivotal point in the plot. After the storm subsides, Pi discovers a new sense of calm and a newly reconciled relationship with the tiger. Now, they're still shipwrecked, but Pi's perspective has changed, and he's at peace with himself and his situation. I spent a lot of time thinking about that moment in the book this week, and I realized that it is perhaps for many of us here the most challenging part of Pi's story. It is for me. We can readily relate to Pi's ignorance of the danger the tiger poses when he's a young boy. We can relate to the ways he seeks to escape and avoid the tiger when he discovers it on the lifeboat. We've shared Pi's experiences of denial and avoidance, his attempts to dominate and control a situation not of his own making. Those things make sense to us. But surrendering, letting go, that's a whole other matter, at least it is for me. If we let go, isn't that the same as giving up? How many of us have seen that, that bumper sticker that says, let go, let God, and either kind of rolled our eyes or said to ourselves, yeah, right. So I thought that if I struggle with this idea of surrender, maybe, maybe, perhaps some of you do too. And maybe it's worth spending some time looking at. We all like to think that we're in control, that we're capable, powerful people. We love that Marianne Williamson quote that says, our biggest fear isn't that we're inadequate, but that we're powerful beyond measure. I think we like it because it affirms our agency, our power, our ability to be great people and to do great things. And I don't want to disabuse any of us from this belief because I truly believe that we are all these tiny bundles of pure potential. We are rocks sitting at the top of a mountain and with just the right push, we're capable of starting a landslide. And at the same time, at the same time, there is another truth that we are far less willing to admit to ourselves. Th that truth is that there are powerful forces that block us, that block our progress, that thwart our efforts, that keep our rocks from rolling. Things that we can't see or touch or feel, but that are no less real than our own talents, our own determination, our own drive. Call it fate or the luck of the draw or even God's will. But the truth is that in our living, things happen that are beyond our control. Our ships sink and tigers show up in our lifeboats and we're thrown into the middle of an angry ocean with no visible means of escape. This reality, the reality of our fragile existence, was brought home in a stark way to a friend of mine just a couple of weeks ago. My friend lives in his car. Now, don't get me wrong, he has a home, but he lives in his car all week long. He's driving hundreds of miles. He puts on thousands and thousands of miles every year. He travels up and down the Atlantic seaboard in his car. Every day, he, gets, he unlocks his door, he gets into his car, he turns the ignition and gets on the road. Doesn't give it a thought. It's what he does. Oftentimes, his mind is elsewhere while he's driving. He's thinking about the job that he's, he's headed to. He's thinking about some other project that he's working on, maybe talking on the phone, planning the week ahead. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, just before New Year's, in fact, he was driving. This was on a weekend. He was close to home. He was, he was on vacation during that week, so he was just doing some errands around town, the kind of things that you and I do every day. And he was just over here on the media bypass. 
It was snowing a little bit, the roads were kind of slushy, but nothing really treacherous. But his, his car hit a patch of ice, and in an instant, he found himself spinning and spinning down the bypass, crossing over the lanes of traffic, bouncing off the guardrail repeatedly until his car came to a rest. Fortunately, there were no other cars around him when it happened. He didn't hit anyone, no one hit him, and he was able to walk away from the accident. It totaled his car, but he was physically all right. But I talked to him the night after the accident to check in on him, and he said he was okay, but I could hear something in his voice. It was a fear, a fear in his voice. And he said to me, one second, everything was fine. And in an instant, I was completely out of control. I was completely out of control. And that's what shook him up the most about what had happened. He realized in that instant the reality of our lives, the reality of his life, that we're perilously close to the edge of control every minute of every day. And we can lose that control at the drop of a hat. While it is one of the great empowering principles of our faith, this belief in our own individual and collective agency. I think it's also one of its greatest failings. Those of us drawn to Unitarian Universalism believe in our ability to control our world, to, to make a difference. That Margaret Mead quote that, that says that never doubt a, that a small group of people can make a difference. In fact, it's all, all that ever has, that lies at the core of our commitment, not only to social justice work, but to everything we do, and in fact, in many ways, everything that we are. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe not only in the inherent worth and dignity of each person, but in the power, the ability, the agency of each individual to determine the direction and the outcome of his or her own life. And so we are shaken to the core when we realize that our lives are only partially in our own hands, that perhaps we are really only holding on by our fingertips. Now I tell you this not to dishearten you, but to actually to enlighten you, to enlighten you, because perhaps the first step toward letting go, toward surrendering, is to admit that we are not as much in control as we would like to think. Perhaps it's easier to consider how we might let go when we realize that it isn't such a stretch from where we already are. But admitting that we're not fully in control or only tenuously in control isn't quite the same as surrendering completely, as admitting that we're powerless. After years and years of madness, and you know the definition of madness, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, right? After years of that madness, we will often likely come to realize that anything we do simply isn't going to make a difference. It isn't going to change things one bit. This is what it means to hit rock bottom. In her book, help, thanks, wow, Anne Lamott calls rock bottom the point when, quote, we have run out of good ideas on how to fix the unfixable. When we finally stop trying to heal our own sick, stressed minds with our sick, stressed minds, when we are truly at the end of our rope and just done. It's at this point, when we reach this point, and I say when, not if, because I think for all of us, there will be a point at some time in our lives. When we reach this point, we have a choice to make. We can either keep doing what we've been doing, which means we're going to keep getting what we've been getting, or we can admit that there is nothing more that we can do. This is the point at which we may finally admit our own powerlessness. In his book, A Hunger for Healing, Keith Miller writes, I believe the delusion of control and power finally breaks down at the point where we are not able to alleviate the stress and our pain through any effort in our repertoire. 
Evidently, what we all want is happiness, yet with all we have accomplished or acquired with our attempts to be in control, many of us reach a place at which we not only cannot control our happiness, even with an addictive substance or behavior, but we cannot control our pain and stress, which has reached an agonizing level. It's too bad that this is what it takes to admit our own powerlessness, but I think that seems to be human nature. We get to that rock bottom, that breaking point. And until we're at that point of complete desperation or despair, of hopelessness and helplessness, of having tried every tool in our toolbox, all to no avail, it's unlikely that we're going to admit that powerlessness. But what then? What if we do? What if we let go, if we surrender, if we admit our powerlessness? Isn't, isn't letting go just a form of giving up, of giving in, throwing in the towel? Yes and no, I think. Letting go, ad admitting our own inability to solve our problems, admitting our powerlessness does mean that we stop trying so hard that we stop spinning our wheels. There's a freedom in hitting rock bottom, Anne Lamott tells us, in seeing that you won't be able to save or rescue your daughter, her spouse, his parents, or your career. Relief in admitting that you've reached the place of great unknowing, she writes. This is where restoration can begin. This is where restoration can begin. I would argue that letting go is an affirmative act. Think about that. Letting go, surrendering, is an affirmative act. It's a choice that we make to stop beating our heads against the wall. It's a point, a choice that we make to open ourselves up to another way. Letting go, surrendering, is a point of departure, which means that it's also the moment when something new can emerge. Letting go is the hinge on which the doorway of possibility swings. Picture the trapeze artist. Picture the trapeze artist. As she clings to the bar, she swings back and forth and back and forth in great, graceful arcs. But she's not getting anywhere. She's not getting anywhere. It's only in opening her hands, in, re in releasing her grip on the bar, in literally letting go, that she's able to break free, to fly across the big top and into the hands of the catcher. The catcher. Now that, I think, is the rub for many of us. The whole crux of this letting go stuff is right there. Who is there to catch us when we finally let go? Who or what do we trust will be there to take our open hands? Can we? Do we trust that we'll be caught? Or are we afraid? Afraid that we'll fall to earth and shatter into a million pieces? This isn't a game. This is our life we're talking about. We're dangling up in the air without a net. Now, in his young life, Pai Patel had already found a deep abiding faith in God before he reached his point of surrender on the lifeboat. lifeboat. But others of us aren't quite so fortunate. Many of us have rejected the God of our childhood and are still in search of something we can grab onto, or maybe that will grab onto us. Some of us have resolved that there is nothing beyond us, that we are all that we have. And some of us are firmly grounded in our not knowing. As you heard earlier in the reading, Anne Lamott urges us not to get stuck on the who or what or if of God. If the idea of God or the word God is, quote, too triggering or ludicrous a concept for you, then call it the good, the force that is beyond our comprehension, but that in our pain or supplication or relief we don't need to define or have proof of or any established contact with. 
and says, let's say, it, let's say it is what the Greeks called the really real, what lies within us beyond the scrim of our values, positions, convictions, and wounds. Or let's say it's a cry from deep within to life or love with capital L's. The 12 step programs speak of coming to believe that a higher power can restore us. Coming to believe. They don't presuppose belief and they frame it in terms of a process, a process of becoming, a movement from one place to the next. That process can begin simply by admitting to the possibility, the possibility of the existence of something greater than ourselves. And Lamott suggests that if necessary, we just start by pretending, just pretend. Suspend your conviction for just a few minutes, she writes, and pretend there is someone outside you who hears you if you pray, she writes. It is admittedly easier to let go, to surrender, if we have a firm conviction before we do. If we're confident that someone or something will be there to catch us. But my friends, I'm afraid sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. Sometimes it is in our letting go that we discover God or good or love or whatever you want to call that, that mysterious thing that is greater than ourselves. It may be in that moment when our car starts sliding on the ice and we're careening toward the guardrail that we discover a peace that overcomes our fears. It may be a moment of grace and beauty snatched from the darkness of depression that offers us a glimpse of hope for a way back to happiness. That's what happened to me. I was at my worst trapped at the bottom of the well of depression with no hope of escape when I went to visit my father in the hospital. He just had surgery for prostate cancer and I was driving home through the New Hampshire hills after visiting him. It was a gray day, a day suited to fit my mental state. I'd been at the bottom of the well for months and was feeling desperate. And then, I'll never forget this moment. And then I rounded a bend in the highway and I noticed that the clouds had parted and the sun was shining on the distant hills. And it was like a curtain had parted for just a moment. And it wasn't the view itself. There was nothing extraordinary about the view. But it was the fact that I noticed the beauty, that I was able to notice the beauty in front of me. That was the moment of grace and hope, the moment when God revealed itself to me. Because I had not noticed beauty in the world for years. And so at that moment, I knew there was hope for me. God, grace, good, love, beauty, whatever you want to call it, were all revealed to me in that flash of sunshine on the New Hampshire hills. And that was the beginning of my recovery. Today, you may be feeling completely in control of your vehicle. If that's the case, I pray that you remain so blessed as long as possible. And I urge you to be prepared for the day when you're not. And perhaps today or yesterday or the day before, your car hit a patch of ice and you began to spin out of control. Maybe you've been bouncing off the guardrail for weeks or months or even years. Maybe you've been in the lifeboat with your tiger for as long as you can, as you can remember. If your hands are wrapped white knuckled around that steering wheel, I invite you to consider loosening your grip maybe even letting go completely. It's scary. God knows that it's scary. I know that it's scary to think about that. But imagine. Imagine what it's like, what it would feel like to be that trapeze artist, 
the one who lets go, the one who soars across the void like a lone wild bird and lands firmly in the grasp of the one who has been waiting to catch her. This day and every day, I wish you peace. Amen.